The Columbia and Challenger disasters were some of the worst tragedies in the history of spaceflight and are an inseparable part of the space shuttle's legacy. What is perhaps most tragic about these failures is just how preventable they were. The issues that led to the fatal loss of the vehicle and crew aboard STS-51L and STS-107 had both already appeared on previous missions. Should NASA had taken the time to seriously analyze and mitigate these problems, it could very well have saved the lives of 14 people. The purpose of this video is not to criticize NASA and its engineers, because hindsight is of course 2020, and I don't want to pretend like I know what decision I would have made had I been in their positions. I simply want to highlight the warning signs that existed and maybe encourage a more reflective and less dismissive approach to calculating risk and understanding potential problems. I want to start today by discussing STS-51C, a mission that included a series of events that bore an eerie resemblance to a flight that would occur just barely a year later. The third flight of Discovery STS-51C was the first classified DOD launch of the Space Shuttle program and launched out of the Kennedy Space Center at 2.50 p.m. Eastern Time on January 24, 1985. With this being in the middle of winter, temperatures were far below the tropical heat typical of Florida, reaching as low as 42 degrees Fahrenheit overnight. Temperatures did climb during the morning, but STS-51C was nonetheless the coldest launch of shuttle to that point in the history of the program. After a routine three-day mission, Discovery eventually returned uneventfully for a landing at the shuttle landing facility at Cape Canaveral. The mission was deemed a success, but it was not until after the two solid rocket boosters, or SRBs, were fished out of the ocean that NASA had any idea something went wrong. If you are at all familiar with the Challenger disaster, you may have some idea as to where this story may be heading. Sure enough, inspections revealed damage to the now notorious O-ring seals. There is evidence that the seals did not properly stop hot gas from escaping from the booster's joint gaps, resulting in noticeable erosion of the critical seals. Both primary and secondary O-rings exhibited signs of damage. In response to the issue, the manufacturer of the SRBs, Morton Thiokol, said, and I quote, The condition is not desirable, but is acceptable. Morton would go on to advise NASA not to launch STS-107 in conditions any colder than those experienced on this mission. They would later reverse this decision, citing inconclusive data. Days later, Challenger launched, an O-ring failed, and the vehicle and crew were lost. Ellison Onizuka, one of the mission specialists on board STS-51C, died on Challenger. The shuttle was grounded for two years and eight months following the Challenger disaster. During that time, significant work was done to increase the safety of the space shuttle. Yet, despite their efforts, there was another near disaster on just the second flight after shuttles returned to service. STS-27 was another classified DOD mission. It launched on December 2, 1988 and spent a little over four days on orbit. A little after payload deployment, the crew received a disturbing report from Mission Control. After analyzing the launch footage, NASA engineers had discovered that insulating material from the nose cone of one of the SRBs had broken loose and showered the right side of Atlantis in debris. Unfortunately, this story might also seem familiar. Footage from after landing quite clearly shows severe damage to the heat shield on the right wing. In fact, over 700 tiles sustained some type of damage as a result of being impacted. Unlike Columbia, which took a direct strike, the impacts that Atlantis took could be described as more of a misting. The damage spanned a larger area, but the individual tiles fared better than on STS-107, with only one completely separating. And, even though I said I wasn't going to be too critical of NASA, some of the decisions NASA made during this mission seem, frankly, inexcusable. During the mission, 
the crew were instructed to use the Canadarm to check for tile damage. Upon seeing the underside of the orbiter, Commander Hoot Gibson was immediately convinced that Atlantis would not be able to survive re-entry. Mission Control, however, perhaps partially because they only had access to encrypted video, concluded that the damage was very minimal and that re-entry would continue as planned. Given the true scale of the damage, this report by NASA engineers is hard to justify in my opinion. It was truly a miracle that STS-27 survived re-entry. Had the debris struck Atlantis even slightly differently, it is very possible the vehicle would have broken up. This dismissive attitude regarding heat shield damage was no small cause of the Columbia disaster. This story has been told many times here on YouTube, but I'm going to tell it again anyway because it is one of my favorite in all of space flight. During the re-entry of STS-27, Gibson kept a very close eye on the shuttle's elevon trim. He decided that if he observed more than 0.25 degrees of trim, which would indicate extra drag and the imminent failure of the orbiter, he would use his last minute of life to tell NASA all of his true feelings about that report they gave. Fortunately, the mission was a success, but this issue of foam strikes did not go away. And since NASA refused to acknowledge the severity of the risk, seven more people tragically died. While there were many different decisions NASA could have made to prevent the losses of Challenger and Columbia, I honestly feel like the entire space shuttle program was a bit like Sisyphus rolling that boulder up the hill. Unbelievable amounts of work, but never really getting to where you want. I believe the space shuttle is one of the greatest engineering feats of all time, but not because it was a good design that worked well, but because it was a horrible design that worked at all. Before we end, I want to conclude with a less grim story. STS-1 was the first flight of the space shuttle, and during launch, NASA had underestimated the strength of the vibrations and shock waves produced by the vehicle. This resulted in several tiles falling off and the orbiter's body flap being deflected to the point where it could have been easily cracked and subsequently failed. While STS-1 ended up being a successful mission, I'm bringing it up because I just feel like underestimating a vehicle's power at launch is a mistake that someone else has made. I just can't quite seem to put my finger on it. I, mm, I don't, I don't know. Mm. I guess not everyone has learned all the lessons of shuttle. But anyway, with that, that's going to conclude today's video, so I'd like to say thank you for watching, we'll see you next time, please rate or comment to this video. Once again, thank you for watching, we'll see you next time, and bye!